Shalom. Most high in Christ bless. Happy Sabbath to everyone. It's February 24th, 2024. Um, we are happy to be here in the place to be one more time. Um, we give all glory and honor to our Father, the Most High in heaven. We give all glory and honor to his Son, uh, Christ, our King. We shalom and, and salute um, all the elders of Israel, the bishops, the uh, deacons, the captains, the uh, uh, officers, the soldiers, the brothers, uh, likewise, the mothers, the wives, the sisters, the daughters, everyone in their respective place. Um, we're going to get, we're going to re start off reading the law. We always start off reading the law. We read the law for just a couple of minutes at a time, about five minutes or so. We don't provide any commentary. Um, following the reading of the law, we get into um, the, the topic. And so we'll get into the topic for today. Um, with no further ado, we're going to get into it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, like, subscribe, uh, share this video. Uh, watch the entirety of the video. If you are not here with us, you need to be reaching out to us so that you can be here with us. All right. With that out the way, let's get into today's class. The laws, Ecclesiasticus chapter 39, verse one. But he that giveth his mind to the law of the most high and is occupied in the meditation thereof will seek out the wisdom of all the ancient and be occupied in prophecies. He will keep the sayings of the renowned men and where subtle parables are, he will be there also. He will seek out the secrets of grave sentences and be conversant in dark parables. He shall serve among great men and appear before princes. He will travel through strange countries where he have tried the good and the evil among men. Fifty-two. To destroy idols and their accessories. Deuteronomy 12 and 2. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherewith the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. Not to derive benefit from idols and their accessories. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 26. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it but thou shalt utterly detest it and thou shalt utterly abhor it for it is a cursed thing. Not to derive benefits from ornaments of idols. Deuteronomy 7 and 25. The graven Im images of the gods shall be burned with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it to thee, uh, lest thou be snared therein. therein. For well, it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Not to make a covenant with idolaters. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 2. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show, show mercy unto them. Not to show favor to idolaters. Deuteronomy 7 and 2. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, 
nor show mercy unto them. Not to let idolaters dwell in the land of Israel. Exodus chapter 23, verse 33. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. Not to imitate idolaters in customs and clothing. Leviticus 20 and 23. And ye shall not walk in the manner of the nation, which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhor them. Not to be superstitious. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 26. You shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment nor observe times. Not to go into a trance to foresee events, etc. Uh, Deuteronomy 18 and 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that th useth divination, or an observation are an observer of times and a enchanter of a or a witch. Not to engage in divination or soothsaying. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 26. You should not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment nor observe times. Not to mutter enchantments. Incantations. Incantations. I'm sorry, I just stuck on that. Deuteronomy 18 and 11 are a charmer or a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Not to attempt to contact the dead. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 11. Or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Not to consult the oh, oh. Deuteronomy 18 and 11. Or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Not to consult the Yodoni. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 11. Or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Not to perform acts of magic. Deuteronomy 18 and 10. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observe, observer of time, and, and or an acron, I'm sorry, enchanter, or a witch. Men must not shave the hair off the sides of their head. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27. You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Men must not shave their beards with a razor. Leviticus 19, 27. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shall thou mar the corners of thy beard. Right, and we will start with 69 next time, Lord willing. 69 next time, Lord willing. All right, so today's class, uh, the title of today's class is Cause Thy Belly to Eat a Roll of a Book. Cause Thy Belly to Eat a Roll of a Book, okay? And we want to start with Ezekiel. Let me get screen up. Let's start at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8. And it reads... But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious 
like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I took, behold, and hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. Chapter 3, verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, Eat that thou findest. Eat this roll. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So what is this role? This role is the Bible that Ezekiel was compelled to eat. The role was the Bible that Ezekiel was compelled to eat. Go back to Ezekiel chapter two, verse eight. And right here, Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. So, write this down. The rebellious, the rebellious, the rebellious. Okay. Let's go to Deuteronomy. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 3. Okay. And so who are we speaking to in this in this chapter? We're speaking to the children of Israel. Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 3. And hath gone and served other gods and worshiped them, either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded. Right? So here the children of Israel have gone off. Okay, who are we talking about? The rebellious house of Israel. That's what Ezekiel said in Ezekiel chapter two, verse eight. He said, like that rebellious house, the house of Israel, the children of Israel he's speaking about. So um, what are some ways that they went off? Worshiping the sun, moon, any host of the heaven. So write this down, write this down. Birthdays, birthdays is one way in which the children of Israel in particular go off and practice idolatry. Birthdays is one way the children of Israel go off and begin to practice idolatry. All right. Let's go to this book right here, Anton Lab Labby, or LaVey. Um, this is the Satanic Bible. This is the Satanic Bible. And we're going to go to page 53. So notice the uh, the title of this chapter, Religious Holidays, okay? Religious Holidays, according to the Satanic Bible. 
Here's what it says. The highest of all holidays in the satanic religion is the date of one's own birth. Talking about your birthday. Talking about your, your birthday. They said that this is the highest of all holidays in the satanic religion. Okay? This is in direct contradiction to the holy of holy days of other religions, which deify a particular God who has been created in an anthropomorphic uh, form of their own image, thereby showing that the ego is not really buried. The Satanist feels, why not really be honest? And if you're going to create a God in your image, why not create that God as yourself? In quotation marks, right? Look at the quotation marks. This, so I don't know who this is being quoted. I don't know if this is Anton LaVey. I, I don't know who this is that's being quoted, but he goes on. Every man is a God if he chooses to recognize himself as one. So the Satanist celebrates his own birthday as the most important holiday of the year. Who does this? The Satanists. The Satanists. After all, aren't you happier about the fact that you were born than you are about the birth of someone you have never even met? Or, for that matter, aside from religious holidays, why pay higher tribute to the birthday of a president or to the date in history than we do to the day we were brought into this greatest of all worlds, okay? So birthdays is a form, is one of the forms wherein this rebellious house of Israel went off worshiping uh, the sun, the moon, and any of the host, any, any of the host of heaven, which I com have not commanded. Okay? Now, go to Ecclesiastes. Chapter 7, verse 1. Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of one's birth, the Bible says. And the day of death. Why am I bringing, why am I showing this scripture? Um, even in the book of Josephus, Josephus tells us that we did not celebrate birthdays. Um, there is an entire class that we could teach like an entire 30, 40 minute um, pull out of scriptures and texts that we could show that the Israelites of the Bible did not celebrate birthdays. It's not a practice that was common um, um, of the children of Israel. Other nations did it, but not the Israelites. Okay. So what is another way that um, the children of Israel go off when it says worshiping either sun, moon, or any host of heaven. Write down astrology, which is, a, this is akin to birthdays, astrology. Okay, let's take a look at this article. What's your sign, Sagittarius? What's your sign? Oh, you know, uh Aries, Aries in, in uh Capricorns don't don't they don't get together and all this kind of all this nonsense. Okay. So 
This is the article. We're going to come down here and look at the origins of this, this article. Where is it at? I am looking for it. Apparently, I... Oh, here it is. Right here. Origins of Zodiac Signs Summary. Okay. Origins of the Zodiac Signs are rooted in the 17 Sumerian constellations known as the Path of the moon and were reduced to 12 major Babylonian zodiac signs. The astrology of Mesopotamia was adopted and altered by the Greeks. It was adopted and altered by the Greeks and transmitted to India, East India. Where they wear the red dot. Okay. Um, and these are these are the various signs: Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo. Um, there's more. Must be too large. Um, here we go. So this this is. The, these are the, the the star constellations where all of this comes from. Okay, Taurus, um, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, uh, Scorp uh, Scorpion, Sagittarius, um, Aquarius, um, or Cap uh, Capricorn. Um, and Aries, Aries, okay. All right, so this is another um, nonsense, foolishness that our people get off into, in which case we have no business getting off into. We have no business um, get us. Uh, Studying this stuff, you know, uh, and entertaining ourselves with this stuff, uh, et cetera. Okay. Write down another. Write down one more. Forsaking and profaning the Lord's Sabbath. Forsaking and profaning the Lord's Sabbath. Okay? So, let's go to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3. Start there. Six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So the definition, according to this, was that it is the seventh day of the week. The seventh day of the week. Well, what is the seventh day? According to dictionary.com, according to dictionary.com, Saturday is the seventh day of the week. 
So to anyone that says, well, we don't know what the seventh day of the week is. Well, someone does. Someone is claiming that they know by putting it in a dictionary. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. They put it in a dictionary. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, we've been following it for, for centuries now. For centuries, this is this is what's what is told to uh one civilization after the other. That Saturday is the seventh day of the week. Okay. So then, so we know that this is supposed to be observed on the seventh day of the week. And then it tells us that we're supposed to have a holy convocation. That word convocation, what does that word mean? Convocation. This is the definition right here. A formal assembly. A formal assembly. And this says at a college or university, especially for a graduation ceremony. Um, the act of convoking. Uh, the state of being convoked. Okay, we could we could go and and look up the word convoking. Okay, why not? Here's what it here here is what it means to convoke, to call together, summon, summon to meet or assemble, summon. Well, let's look up the word summon. Because maybe we just don't know what the meaning of these words. Look what it says. Um, to call for the presence of as by command. As by command. As by command. Okay. So Leviticus 23 and 3. says that six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. So we are commanded to come together. We are commanded to come together. Go to Exodus chapter 31. We're going to read verse 14 through 17. Okay. It reads, Ye shall keep the Sabbath there, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days. May work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for 
a perpetual covenant. For a perpetual covenant. Now, verse 17. Verse 17. Crucial. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. You say you love the Lord. You say you follow Christ. You say you're a believer. Look at what verse 17 says. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. This is what the Bible says. Okay. Okay. Go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. This is what the Bible says. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Seven days. On the seventh day, of the week, we're supposed to do this. Jump to verse 10. Let's jump to verse 10. Verse 10, right here. Highlighted. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it, thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. You got to shut down. Your family has to shut down. Your beasts of burden have to shut down. Your, uh, your employees, your staff, your crew has to shut down on the Sabbath day. Week after week, after week, after week, for all eternity. Go to 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 43. 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 43. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. This is not only in this day and age, um, back here in, in, in this his, historical time period, the time period of the Maccabees, but even right now today, there are Israelites, um, you so-called blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. You consent to your oppressors, you consent to your oppressor's religion. You consent to your oppressor's sacrifice and you sacrifice to his idols, which is why you go to church on Sunday. You believe you're doing the Lord's work, but you're not because the Lord told you it's the seventh day of the week, not the first day of the week, the seventh day of the week, not on Sunday, and, and, and you believe that you are doing the Lord's work. You're not. You're not. You are doing the work of your oppressor. You are consenting to his religion. And you profane the Sabbath. That's what's going on. Now, watch this. What? Our forefathers said back in the day. Go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13. We're going to read verse 15 through 22.
Okay. Nehemiah chapter 13, we're starting at verse 15. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves. So when you're pressing the wine, Trying to give some images so that you can have some good visuals. The computer's going slow. I apologize. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. So in ancient time, they would they would have been stomping with their feet. Okay. Um, but of course, today you got you have con contraptions like such, you know, so they're pressing the wine. Okay, ancient days, um, and they're pressing the wine, making making uh, pressing grapes um, to get wine to produce wine. Okay, this is what they're doing. All right, so they 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 and bringing in sheaves. Bringing in sheaves. You would take the the uh, the wheat, the barley, like such. Um, you would put it in bundles, bundles uh, big enough that you could carry, and and that's what it means to bring in the sheaves. This is what what you would have been doing. Okay, so you you were doing work because this stuff is gonna gonna be produced into cornmeal, into flour, um, what have you. Um, you, you could even take stalks like this and produce this so that you get linen to produce clothing, okay? So all this stuff is going to be processed um, so that you could um, make money. All right, let's go back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 15. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath the seventh day of the week, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses as also wine grapes. So lading asses. Here, here is um, some good images right there. This one right here. Okay. How they put all the items on on the uh, the donkey. Okay. Um, you know, how they, let me see if we can find some more. This one, this is a good one. Although it's a cartoon. Okay. Um, so they have all their, their produce and whatnot, the things that they produce so that this animal is going to, um, carry these things wherever they need to be, be taken. That's lading asses. That's what it means. Um, when it says lading asses, this looks like a live picture. I lost it. There's another live picture. I lost the live picture. Ah, uh, okay. I don't. I was. I was hoping to get this one. Okay, and we see um, um, cookware. Okay, in the baskets, um, and on this one we see the sheaves on the um, on the donkeys. All right.
So, in those days, saw I and Judah some treading the wine press on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. Victuals is food. They sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein. Tyre, these are, these are uh, we learned in the previous class, I think last week and the week before, that these are um, uh, descendants of Canaan, descendants of Ham. The term we use today, Africans. These are these are Africans, okay? Um, men of Tyree also therein, which brought fish in all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem, okay? In this time period, during the time period of Nehemiah, the children of Judah, um, these are the so-called African-Americans, the children of Jerusalem. These were um, uh, Benjamin and Levi. So Jamaicans, uh, Trinidadians, and then Levi would be uh, the Haitians. Okay. Verse 17. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, what evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Now, how is it that the people are causing the nation to fall? And see, that's the thing. America has taught us that... Um, you know, I, I can just be myself. All I got to do is just be myself, right? But the Bible is teaching us that it's not being about an individual. It's all about um, a whole nation. So what one person does affects the entire, uh, the entire nation of people. So verse 18. Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. This is what the Bible says. Okay, verse 19. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. This is, this is what Nehemiah said to the people. Nehemiah rebuked the people for working on the Sabbath day. He rebuked them, okay? Verse 20, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 20. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware, ware meaning uh, cookware, uh, dishes, uh, plates, um, what have you. All kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. That's how serious Nehemiah took this thing. Nehemiah took this thing so serious. He said, if you keep doing this, I'm going to lay hands on you. I'm going to lay hands on you. In other words, we're going to throw you, we're going we gonna to take you in and throw you into custody. We're going to take you in and throw you into custody. 
from that time forth came, they no more on the Sabbath. They stopped being uh, dis so disrespectful to our ordinance, to our law, to our established our established rule in this time period. Verse 22. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, oh my God, concerning this also and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. Okay. So now, Brother Michael, that's the Old Testament. Everything you have read so far is the Old Testament, Michael. Christ came and did away with all that stuff. Hmm. Go to Luke chapter 23. We want verse 52 through 56. Okay, we want verse 52 through 56. Here's what it says. Um, this man went unto Pilate. What man? Um, Arimathea, the guy who took Christ off um, the crucifix to, to um, wrap him up. Verse 52. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulchre that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. Okay, so what we're about to read takes place after Christ is now dead. Verse 54. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. So there was an urgency to get this done and to be done with it and not wait until the next day. The next day was Sabbath. The next day was Sabbath. So not only did they need to take the body off the, off the cross for the, for the scripture says in Deuteronomy, um, if any person that, that hangeth on a tree overnight, that, that man is accursed. So not only that, but the Sabbath day was quickly approaching. And so they needed to be done with all they needed to be done before Sabbath kicked in. And when does, when does a day kick in? Well, when we read um, the pattern in Genesis chapter 1, we, we quickly see that the pattern is evening to morning, evening to morning, evening to morning. So that the, the division of evening and morning, making a whole 24 hour day, that's a full day. So it starts at nighttime. At nightfall is the beginning of the day. Not at 12 noon, or I'm sorry, not at 12 midnight. That's not when the day begins. No, 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 no. Whenever that sun is gone, that is the beginning of your day. Then comes the sunlight. Now we're in the second half of the day. Okay, verse 55. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the, the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested. What did they do? And rested and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. No, maybe they, they rested according to, oh, they was heartbroken that Jesus Christ had, um, was killed. Oh, they rested because they did all the work to prepare uh, Christ's body. No, 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 no. That's not what this says. Come on, let's look at what it says. This says they rested 
the Sabbath day according to the commandment. According to the commandment. Come on now, somebody. Okay? Now, this is the weekly Sabbath. Stay with me. Don't click the button and, 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 and go bye-bye. If you're still here right now, don't click the button and go bye-bye. Stay with me. Write some notes. Maybe you disagree. Write some notes that, so that you can leave your comments in the, in, the, in the thing below. Now, I'm still not done with Sabbath. Let's take a look at Sabbath. Go to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4. Because Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3, told us of the weekly Sabbath. So we just dealt with the weekly Sabbath. That happens um, every seventh day, week over week over week over week, 52 times in a year. 52 times in a year. Now this, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocation. There's that word again, convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. So now we have Sabbaths dealing with seasons. Dealing with seasons, okay? Go to Exodus chapter 23. And we're going to look at verse 14 through 16. What does it tell us? Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. So three times, the Bible says, we are commanded to come together. In addition to the... Uh, Week over week over week over week over week over week. Now, we're also told that we must come together three times. And we were told that this is a holy convocation. Look what it says. Look what it says in, in, in Leviticus. It says, even holy convocations in their seasons. And we look at the word. This means uh, summon, which means command. Okay, so there's no confusion now when we know how to look up words. So here we are, Exodus chapter 23 and verse 15. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month of bib. Now the word of bib means an ear corn. This is the first month of the year according to the Bible. This takes place between March and April. Mid to late March to early to mid April is when the month of bib takes place. For in it thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty, the Bible says. Okay, uh, verse 16. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering which is in the end of the year. When thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Okay. Um, so now. Write down feast of harvest. Feast of harvest.
Let's go to Exodus chapter 34, verse 22. Okay. Exodus chapter 34, verse 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Okay. So here are the here are the two. The other one was um, um, the feast of unleavened bread. Okay. But now, let's go to Exodus chapter 23, verse 16. Exodus chapter 23, verse 16. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered um, in thy labors out of the field. Okay, and so these are the these are the two um, two of the three that um, we have to keep day in and day out. And I want to I want to explain expound on this so we see exactly what the Bible is talking about. So stick stick with me, stick with me. Okay. Let's go to Numbers chapter 28, verse 16 through 18. Numbers chapter 28, verse 16 through 18. Let's take a look at the first. Well, the number two of three, number two of three. Okay. Oh, this, yeah, this is the first one. Um, so here we go. Numbers chapter 28, verse 16. And in the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. Is the Passover of the Lord. So we must come together for Passover, not Easter. We don't celebrate Easter. And in the 15th day of this month, is the feast seven days shall be unleavened bread be eaten so we must uh keep the feast of unleavened bread and we come together for this in the first day shall be in holy convocation there's that word again the first day of this we must have a holy convocation you are summoned. You are summoned to come together. You are commanded to come together. Okay? You shall do no manner of servile work therein. All right? Go to Numbers chapter 29 verse 12 numbers chapter 29 verse 12 reads and on the 15th day of the seventh month on the seventh month Ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work, and ye shall keep the feast unto the Lord seven days. So we must keep. So let's recap. We have to keep the Passover. And, and as we keep the Passover, um, we also will keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then we're also going to keep the uh, uh, Feast of Tabernacle, which is what this is talking about. 
We're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacle. Okay? And then we're going to see the other one in just a second. We're going to see the other one that is um, a, a pivotal or vital for us to keep. Okay. In a second. So bear with me. Be patient. Be patient. Endure. Go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 12 through 13. There's a reason I'm going through all these scriptures. And I'll explain at the end. So, so bear with me. Okay. Here we are. 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. This is Solomon. This is King Solomon. Yes, I know. This is the Old Testament. I get you. It reads, Then Solomon offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the porch, even after a certain rate every day, offering according to... The commandment of Moses on the Sabbaths and on the new moons. We haven't even talked about new moons as a Sabbath day. We haven't even discussed that. We So far, what we've discussed is the weekly Sabbath and the three times in the year that we have to come together. And on the solemn feast, three times in a year, we discuss the solemn feast, three times in a year, even the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of weeks, and the feast of tabernacle. Now, feast of weeks, we're about to see that in, in just, oh, we're about to see it right now. Feast of Weeks, we're about to see it right now. Okay. But my point, if it wasn't clear uh, the, through, through the inflection of my voice, Solomon was establishing things according to the commandment of Moses. Solomon was requiring the nation to, to keep the Sabbath days, the weekly Sabbath, the new moon Sabbath, which means that happens every, that happens once, month over month. Every time we see a, um, what the world calls a full moon, every time we see a full moon in the sky, that is the beginning of a month and the solemn feast. Okay. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, day of Pentecost is dealing with the uh, Feast of Weeks. Because at the at, right after Passover, seven weeks later, we get the um, the piece of uh, uh, day of Pentecost. Why are they keeping this? Because they were keeping the commandments of God. So was it they were just keeping the the uh, uh, day of Pentecost? No, they kept the day of Pentecost. They kept the day. Uh, they kept the feast of Tabernacle. They kept the Passover. They kept the um, uh, 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 first um, uh, feast of unleavened bread. They, we read in the in the gospel all the time, and it was the Sabbath day, and it was the Sabbath day, and it was the Sabbath day, and Jesus Christ did this, and it was the Sabbath day, all the time. Okay. Um. All right, and then go to John. Chapter 7, verse 2. John chapter 7, verse 2. Now the Jews 
feast of tabernacles was at hand. Look at that. There it is recorded right there. And actually, there's one more that came about. It um, Moses did not write this and memorialize it for us. It happened in the time period of the Maccabees. And that is the Feast of Dedication. We read about that in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 22. Okay. Um, look at what it says. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of dedication. And it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. So answer me this. Why is Jesus Christ keeping all of these festival days that Moses documented, that was documented and established in the time period of the Maccabees, why is Jesus Christ keeping it? Why is it that the saints, that they're doing it even after Christ is dead? Because they wrapped his body up and on the Sabbath day, they rested. Why is that if Jesus did away with it? If that was his teaching and, and his disciples and his followers followed him for three years. Why are they still doing it? Why? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. That's what the Bible says. Keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. The laws that Moses gave us, Christ did not change. He didn't do away with them. And if he did, show me the proof. What's the proof that it happened? Go to Jeremiah. Chapter 9, verse 13 through 16. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 13 through 16. Okay. And the Lord saith, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart. How do you walk out the imagination of your own heart when you say, nah, um, I, don't, I don't see it that way? But it sounds like black and white. Well, that's your interpretation. Precept upon precept, it lines up. So when you're doing that, when, when you are the individual that's doing that kind of uh, skating, skating around what the text actually says, you're walking after your own imagination. And after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, even this people with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the heathen whom neither they nor their fathers have known. And I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. 
Here's a very scary thing. Here's a very scary thing. With what I am presenting and you who watch this, who are in disagreement with what I am presenting, one of us is wrong. Can we agree? One of us is wrong. And should it be that it's you that's wrong? Look what it says. I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. If I'm wrong, show me the law, show me the text in the Bible that says that a sword is coming after me because I'm trying to do, I'm trying to keep the laws and the faith of Jesus Christ. Where is where is the scripture that says that me walking the way I walk, there is a sword coming after me. But if you're wrong, it says, I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. It's a very, very scary place to be. That's just my opinion. That's my opinion. That that's a scary place to be. Go to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 4. They that forsake the law praise the wicked. They that forsake the law praise the wicked. But such as keep the law contend with him. But such, so, but such that keep the law contend with him. Where is the passage that says that that man or woman who is striving to walk according to the law and the faith of Jesus Christ should have reason to be ashamed, should have reason to be fearful. That's not what this says in Proverbs 28, verse 4. But, it, but what is said in Proverbs 28, verse 4, they that forsake the law Raise the wicked. This is what it says. I want you to ponder this question. I want you to think about this question. Biblically speaking, maybe write this down if you need to. Biblically speaking, is there a difference between the following Four words. Write these four words down. Write these four words down. Write these four words down. Commandment. Law. Ordinance. O-R-D-I-N-A-N-C-E. O-R-D-I-N-A-N-C-E. And statute, S T A T U T E. Is there a difference between the following four words that I just spoke to? Commandment, law, ordinance, statute. Biblically speaking, biblically speaking. All right, let's look at the first word. And where will we go? We're going to go to kingjamesbibledictionary.com. I guess you see my, my, it's thinking. King James Bible Dictionary. 
Here is the definition of commandment. A command, a mandate, an order or injunction given by authority. Charge or precept, okay? Um, all right, let's go to the next word, ordinance. Because in the Bible, these words pop all the time, okay? Um, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, we need law. I lost, I lost law, whatever happened to law. So let me, let me pull it up. Have no fear. We're going to bring it here. <laughs> Law. A rule of action. Okay. Um, let's see. Number two. Let's look at number two. The ceremonial law prescribes un, uh, 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 prescribes prescribes under the Old Testament the rites and ceremonies of worship. The law was obligatory only till Christ, of whom these rites were typical, had uh, had finished his work. Okay, it was filled rather. This 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 is definition number two. Let's look at all of these so we can see. Um, what is saying that? What's there? Okay. Moral positive laws um, are commanded by God. Uh, positive laws are precepts found only on the will of God. Um, the moral law is revealed. So moral laws, you know, we're going to, I'm going to touch on this too in just a second since they're saying this, all right? Um, these laws binds all men at all times. It is generally designated by the term conscience or capacity of being influenced by moral laws. So we're going to get to, we, I, I'm going to touch on this moral thing in just a second. This makes me think of something. But we're looking at these four words. We're simply asking the question, is there a difference? Ordinance. Ordinance is a decree. A decree. Um, a rule established by authority. A permanent rule of action. An ordinance may be a law or statute of sovereign power. Okay. Um, Established right of ceremony. All right. So let's continue with the fourth one. Statute. Statute. An act of the legislator of a state that extends its binding force to all the citizens or subjects of that state as distinguished from an act which extends only to an individual or company. Okay, um, a special act of supreme power. Now, let me pull up also this other thing. Since it was speaking about um, morals. So sociologists, they, they come up with this thing. Uh, where is it at? Here we go. They come up with this, with this called um, four types of norms. Folkways, mores, morals, taboos, and laws. So, folkways are, let me make sure that it's large enough for everybody. Folkways are customs 
that we follow, but are often not written down. We learn them through intuition as we grow up. Like, for example, uh, sundown towns. So even now, there are certain areas where you be in the wrong color, you may not want to go into certain areas. Those are folkways. Taboos. Taboos are negative norms. Things that people find offensive and socially inappropriate if you are caught doing them. Okay? Um, mores are moral norms. If you break them, you would be seen as not just in poor taste, but immoral. They're often linked to religious rules. And then laws. Laws are norms that are actually defined as being legal or illegal. The government has decided these norms are so important that you could get in trouble for breaking them. So in the Bible, we have laws. Okay. So is there a difference between these four, wor four words? Between commandment, law, ordinance, and statute? Let's go to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Write down this word, sanctified. Write down this word, sanctified. He says, I will be sanctified. Okay. Go to Leviticus chapter 22, verse 9. They shall therefore keep mine ordinance, lest they bear sin for it and die therefore if they profane it. I, the Lord, do sanctify them. Now, I want to go back to these definitions because I know somebody out there is saying, wait a minute, Brother Michael, you overstepped that one that said law. Let's go back to this one that says law. Here in definition number two. <clears throat> it says, this law Speaking of <clears throat> ceremonial law, speaking of ceremonial law, this law was obligatory until Christ, of whom these rites were typical. Well, let me tell you, I'm going to say that this King James Bible Dictionary, for whatever reason, this information is inaccurate. This right here, this information is inaccurate. Let me show you. And we're going to get back to the scriptures in, in one second, but let me show you. I've done this before. Let me do it again.
in the Bible, there are in the Bible there's there are some six hundred thirteen. laws okay 613 laws and all of these laws can be um we we organize we as humans we like to organize things and they can be organized into five different categories they can be or um, cat, um categorized into moral law um Ceremonial law into uh, dietary law into uh, oh wait 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 before I go to ceremonial civil law and then last. Sacrificial. Sacrificial law. Now, of these five categories, this one that one is obsolete. This one is obsolete. Now, let me prove it. Let's go to the scripture. Uh, um, whoa, whoa, whoa. We are, I am going to prove it. These four, these are not obsolete. These are not obsolete. This one is obsolete. Let me prove it. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Okay. And we start at verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, the law, this is talking about animal sacrifice. The law in this context, it is not talking about all 613. It is not talking about all 613. It is talking about this category right here. It is talking about this category right here, sacrificial. Okay? Let me continue to prove it. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For they, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Here's the proof right here. And you can read the, the the rest of this chapter um at, at you know in your own time for context. So Hebrews chapter 10, 
verse 1 through 4, is, is proving to us that what has a, a, a slash through it is this one right here, sacrificial. Now, there needs to be one more word with this category. One more uh, word, and that is Levitical uh, priesthood. Okay, so we have this category, moral law. We have this category, civil law. We have this category, ceremonial law. We have this category, dietary law. And then we have this fifth category, sacrificial slash Levitical priesthood. This is the one that has a line through it. Let me continue to prove the point. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 7. And we're going to start at verse 10. Uh, verse 11. We'll start at verse 11. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed, for the priesthood being changed, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. What was the change? Did, did the function of the priesthood go away? It did not. Did the um, that the person who is to, for, to operate in that function change? It does. Let's read on. Verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Christ is a Judite, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Who? Christ. Okay, so... This is the proof, Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter, 11, uh, chapter 10. This is the proof that this, the sacrificial, the laws pertaining to um, um, uh, sacrifices and Levitical priesthood, that changed. But the laws pertaining to dietary, ceremonial, civil, moral, that does not change at all. That doesn't change. Ceremonial law. This is this right here, an example of a ceremonial law is keeping the Sabbath day. An example of a ceremonial law is keeping is coming together three times in a year 
what we've already discussed early on in this lesson. Ceremonial law would be the keeping of the new moon. So this is incorrect when this when when whoever wrote this when whoever wrote wrote this in the dic here in this dictionary coming from Easton's uh Bible dictionary and they said that Ceremonial law prescribes under the Old Testament the rites and ceremonies of worship. This law was obligatory only till Christ. Um, well, wait a minute. This is not inaccurate. In that, in that, if what they're saying, if what they're saying, if what they are saying. If what they're saying is that this was the change, so that meaning talking about the Levitical priests, the functions of the Levitical priests, because the Levitical priests, a lot of their functions dealt with ceremonial things. A lot of their functions, a lot of their functions dealt with ceremonial events, ceremonial things. So, so, if if that's what they're talking about, then I retract. I pull back from from my um, my 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 attack on Easton's Bible um, with concerning what this says. If that's what they're talking about. Okay. All right. But we were at Leviticus chapter 22 and verse nine, where it says, they shall therefore keep mine ordinance. Keep mine ordinance. Now go to Exodus chapter 19, verse 22. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. Right? So when we come before the Lord, the priests, they had to sanctify themselves. Okay? Go to, I, I, a question I want you to ask yourself, self, what does it mean to sanctify Go to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. What does it mean to sanctify yourself? Go to John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Oh, so we get sanctified through the word of God, through the Bible. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. By the word is how we sanctify and become cleansed. The word, the words in the book, 
Go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Heart, meaning your mind, meaning your mind, meaning your mind. Not your emotions, not your feelings. Meaning your reasoning faculty. Your reason faculty. Your ability to logically think through using information. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And where do you get this? Always give an answer. Because you study to show thyself approved. You study the word. You rehearse the word. Okay. So then, let's go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee, be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. A book was therein. A book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So when I read the book, I come across information. I come across these prophecies that say, go to, go to Deuteronomy, Chapter 28, verse 15. It reads, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And then so we get into Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, the book of Lamentations. We get into uh, Song of Solomon. Uh, we get into Ezekiel. We get into Hosea. We get into uh, Zechariah and Zephaniah. We get into um, Habakkuk, we get into uh, Nehemiah, we get into all these books and we see the turmoil that come upon the children of Israel even all the way to the book of Revelation we see all the turmoil that are going to come that come upon the children of Israel Go to Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5, we want verse 15 and 16. Or 16 and, and 17, I apologize. Amos chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, wailing shall be in all streets and they shall say in all the highways alas alas and they shall call the husbandmen to mourning and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing and in all vineyards 
shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. These are the passages we come upon when we eat the book, when we eat the scroll. These are the passages we come upon. Go to Isaiah. Chapter 32. Verse 10 through 15. Many days and years shall ye be troubled. Ye careless women. For the vintage shall fail. The gathering shall not come. Tremble, ye women that are at ease. Be troubled, ye careless ones. Strip you and make you bare. And gird sackcloth upon your loins. They shall lament for the tits. For the pleasant fields for the fruitful vine. Upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars, yea, upon all the houses of joy in the joyous city, because the palaces shall be forsaken. The multitude of the city shall be left and forts and towers shall be for dens forever. A joy of wild asses, a pasture of flocks, until, until the spirit be poured upon us from on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Future tense until Christ returns, until Christ returns. So what, the little babies, they don't have moms to nurse. Them. The pleasant fields, you don't have land to let your animals roam. And, 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 and eat and, and, and grow. Your, your uh, pastures, strawberry patch, your grape patch, so on and so forth. Where are you going to grow it at? You live in a congested city in New York where rent is sky high. Okay. This is, this is, these are examples of the lamentation we read about. Go to Hosea, chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Rejoice not, O Israel, but joy as other people. But thou has gone a whoring from thy God. Thou has loved a reward upon every cornfield. The floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. We don't provide for our own. We hire ourselves out. We are servants in this land to the oppressor. We are oppressed and servants in this land. At every turn, we are fearful for our life. In Texas, two female officers shot up the place at the woman, saying that she, that they, they, she broke in the house. These are, these are the things that we are faced with Daily. Daily. White boy beat up a girl in school and said, it wasn't racist. 
But yet the white boy was calling the calling the girl nigger chasing after her or whatever. And the recording has him saying nigger. These are the things we deal with day in and day out. Let's look at this article. Because the Bible said that we were going to go into slavery. We're the only race of people that, that, have, that have experienced slavery the way we experience slavery. No other race on this planet can say that they have experienced, that their ancestry has experienced slavery the way we did. Not even the, the Jewish man. He... He never experienced. He was a slave. He he practiced slavery. We're the only ones, and the Bible says that this will be a sign for us to know who we are, who we be. The horrors and pains of slavery captured in these sculptures. Look at the anguish in this face, in the sculpture of this face. Look at the anguish. Shackles around the neck. During the period of the Atlantic slave trade from approximately 1526 to 1867, some 12.5 million slaves were shipped from Africa to Americas. The Holocaust says that 6 million people lost their life. We doubled that. We doubled that. And depending on uh, the account of the, the various scholars, this 12 million is up to 14 million. The, the Atlantic slave trade is uh, to date one of the worst calamities to have ever befallen the African continent. Look at this. Look at this. Shamed. Exposed. The methods of transporting slaves were so inhumane that most of them died even before reaching America. The slaves were separated according to their sexes and physical strength, kept naked and packed close together and the men were chained for long periods of time. Why? To break you. To break you. Look at this. Now, with these scars on his face, this causes me to believe that, uh, well, the scars are right there at his eye, not on his cheek, that this is, because uh, this is what we see... Uh, among um, um, uh, Nigerians. Infant and child mor mortality rates were twice as high among slave children as among Southern white children. Half of all slave infants died in their first year of life. A major contributor to the uh, high infant and child death rate was chronic undernourishment. The average birth rate weight of slave infants was less than 5.5 pounds, considered severely underweight by today's standard. All right, look at this. And these, th this is just uh, 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 stone and metal. Making, making these facial expressions of what we went through, what our forefathers went through, what our ancestors went through. 
¿Qué? See this? This is what we went through. No other race on the planet went through this. No other race on the planet went through this. But the Bible says that the children of Israel would experience these things. So who are the children of Israel? You so-called blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans are the only people that experience this. Go to Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10 through 12. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadarimon in the valley of Meg uh, Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. Who experienced that? We did. We did. And he ate the scroll and the bitterness at first it was sweet, and then all the bitterness came. Why? Because when we read the Bible and, and, and we allow ourselves to be properly taught, when we allow ourselves to be properly taught what the scripture is saying, we see these prophecies, and we see our own history and how our history connects to the prophecies. And it causes us to feel that bitterness. It causes us to mourn. We understand the mourning and the lamentation. Go to Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3, verse 4. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Solomon told us that there are, mul there are multiple times. Sometimes we it's time to cry. Sometimes it's a time to laugh. Etc. Go to Psalms chapter 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk up rightly it says no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly go to proverbs chapter 2 verse 7 he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. 
to them that walk uprightly. Go to Baruch chapter four, verse two. Turn thee, O Jacob, and take hold of it. Walk in the presence of the light thereof, that thou mayest be illuminated. How are you going to be illuminated? Except you read the Bible. Except you read his word and be sanctified and cleansed by the washing of the word. Go to 1 Maccabees, chapter 2, verse 20. Yet will I and my sons and my brethren walk in the covenant of our fathers. This hasn't changed. We have to walk in the covenant of our fathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We have to walk in the covenant of our fathers. Christ walked in the covenant of the fathers. Go to Ezekiel chapter two, verse nine. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. The roll of a book. Go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Our understanding of God, our understanding of Christ, our understanding of how we are supposed to be, conduct ourselves, is in the pages of this book, not in the imagination of our mind, our deceitful mind. Go to um, Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 10. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. And he spread it before me, the book, the scroll. He spread it before me. Go to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. You got to read. And we have to read precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. It's, you cannot, you gotta, you gotta dismiss the imaginations of your deceitful mind. You must. Because in your deceitful mind is Christianity. In your deceitful mind is Islam. In your deceitful mind is Latter-day Saints. In your deceitful mind is Jehovah Witness. In your deceitful mind is Seven-day Adventists. In your deceitful mind is do what you want to do. Go to Isaiah chapter 30. 
verse 8 through 11. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. How are you going to know if you're not reading the book? Verse 9, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. This is what the rebellious do. They don't want to hear the word of God. They want to turn away. Um, see, you keep turning to a page. You keep, I, I, I asked you a simple question. Well, I'm trying to give you a simple answer by turning to the page. Ezekiel chapter three, verse one. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. Eat that thou findest. When the law came before you and said, yada, 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 Keep the Sabbath day. Don't shave off your beard. Don't eat pork. Don't eat shrimp. You a man, don't put a dress on. You a woman, don't put pants on. Don't commit adultery. Don't put your wife away. And all these different laws Eat thou, eat that thou findest. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. That thy profiting, that we, that everyone see you profiting in the, in the word of God. And your profiting don't mean that you're getting gold and riches like Creflo Dollar teaches and Benny Hinn teaches. That's that, no, 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 no. That's not what this is saying. We see the change in you. We see the 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 uh, we see the niggardom coming off of you. Go to Joshua chapter one verse eight. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. This is, this is the book of Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Go to the book of Psalms, chapter 1, verse 2. Go 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, doth he meditate day and night. All these precepts, speaking about the law, the law, the law, the law, the law. How do you pervert that? Accept it your ways, your ways in and of itself is grounded in wickedness. Go to Psalms 119, verse 48. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. This is what this is what David is saying. Time and time again. Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Here's the words of Christ. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What good works? You're walking according to the commandments and according to the faith of Jesus Christ. That's the good works. Go to Philippians chapter two, verse 15 and 16. Philippians chapter two, verse 15 and 16 that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. See what, see what the, the New Testament is telling us to do? The New Testament is telling us to be blameless. Go to Ezekiel chapter three, verse two. So I opened my mouth and he calls me to eat that roll. I, I, I surrendered. I gave it a shot. And he, oh man, he calls me to eat that thing. Go to Acts chapter 26. New Testament. Acts chapter 26, we're going to read verse uh, 14 through 19. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Saul thought he was doing it. He, he thought, Saul thought he was doing it, doing it righteously, boy. But he wasn't. Christ had to come and intervene. Verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of 
those things in, in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient. I was not disobedient. When, when Paul saw, when he heard that he wasn't doing things as he should, he went, he was retaught. And he moved forward. He didn't resist. Go to Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Okay, go to John. It was in my mouth for honey as sweetness. Go to John chapter 7, verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. We believe as the scripture says, not our an own vain imagination. Go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. How? In psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, singing with grace and in your hearts to the Lord. Teaching and admonishing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We're almost done. Go to John chapter 6, verse 45 through 63. John chapter 6, verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me, Christ says. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Go to Matthew. We're coming right back to that. Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. He that believeth on me. What did Christ say? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Christ was teaching the law. And he's telling you to be perfect in the law. 
go back to John. John chapter 6 and verse uh, 48. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Right? So if you're not believing, if you don't have the faith, because this is how you eat it, you must have faith that Christ died for you. And you must be obedient to the law. Two things have to, um, have to happen. Verse 52. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto him, unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. You bucking and railing at the Mosaic law, you have no life in you. You bucking and railing at the, of the faith that Christ gave his life so that you can... Uh, so that you can have eternal life, you have no life in you. Verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living father hath sent me and I live by the father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Christ, Christ kept all the laws. So if you're going to live by Christ, likewise, you're going to follow in his footsteps. You're going to keep all the laws. Minus what we discussed earlier. The sacrificial law. Verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. What's the eating of this bread? The fact that your faith is, your faith is such that you believe that Christ gave his life for you. You hold on to that, to that belief, and your actions conform to the keeping of the laws. You hold on to the faith that Christ died on the cross for you. And your actions and your actions conform to the keeping of the laws. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Does it offend you that you have to keep the laws and you have to keep the faith of Jesus Christ, the faith that he died for you? Verse 62. What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit. It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, 
They are spirit and they are life. And where are you going to get the words? Through the reading of the text. Through the reading of the text. Okay? So now. Title of the class. Pause thy belly to eat a roll of a book. And so our prayer is that you would eat the words of the book. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And when you eat it, don't regurgitate it and spit it out. But eat it and let it nourish you whole. Repent and call on the name of Christ. With that, we say shalom, most high in Christ, blessed to each and every last one of you.